Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. Um, happy Halloween. My name is Jen Briones. I'm an associate with the Data Quality Campaign and I'm pleased to be joined by my co-presenters, both of whom are from New Leaders. First, um, Krista Lewis-Johnson, who is the Director of Design and Development, and Ed Morris, who is the Executive Director of Instructional Design and a former New Leaders Principal. Um, also, we know that today is the last day of National Principals Month, and so we are really excited to close out the last day of this month that is just dedicated to celebrating principals with what we hope will be a really great conversation. And I also want to thank NASSP for um, putting this webinar on, their, on the National Principals Month website and also helping with promotion. And then before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Everyone who's tuning in is currently muted, um, but we will have plenty of time to answer any questions you have at the end of the webinar. So please do submit your questions using the questions feature. We're also recording the webinar, so you can have it and send to your networks after. And yeah, with that, we will go ahead and get started. If we can flip to the next slide, please. So our webinar objectives, um, we're going to give a brief overview of each of our organizations. I'm going to review what we mean by data literacy and state's role in supporting school leaders and their data literacy. Um, Ed and Krista are both going to share about new leaders, both their, their experiences with new leaders and also the role of the organization in developing principles, data literacy skills. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, we'll have time for to answer any questions. Next slide, please. So for those who are unfamiliar with the Data Quality Campaign, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit policy and advocacy organization. And what you see on your screen currently is what we call our big idea, which is that when students, parents, teachers, school leaders, policymakers, partners have the information they need to make decisions, that is when students excel. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ed to give a little bit of background on New Leaders. Thanks so much. So here at New Leaders, our mission is simply to ensure that we have high academic achievement for all children um, by developing what we call at New Leaders, breakthrough leaders um, to work in schools and systems where they are needed the most. Um, our work is grounded in one simple belief and it's backed by decades of research and experience. And that is, that we believe that leadership changes absolutely everything. You have great leaders that create great schools where teachers and students and their families can thrive together. Next slide, please. So since 2000, um, the leaders have had the opportunity to train approximately 3,200 outstanding school leaders who in this current school year are reaching nearly half a million students. Um, we have active partnerships in well over 30 cities and with over 150 some odd charter schools that we're working with. Our leaders um, overwhelmingly work with some of the country's highest need students. Um, for example, approximately 78% of our students served um, come from what we call low-income families, and 87% of the students that we serve are children of color. Another thing that we're proud of at New Leaders is that our leaders represent the communities that we serve. Approximately 64% of New Leaders are people of color, like myself and Krista, um, compared to the national average of just around 20%. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jen. Next slide, please. So we're here this afternoon to talk about data literacy. And I know that many of you tuning in are school principals. And at the end of the day, you know, data systems are meaningless without people like you who use different types of data on a daily basis. Because when school and district administrators are empowered to lead that culture of data use, the leadership that Ed was just talking about, that's when students do better. Next slide. 
And so DQC was proud to partner with new leaders, NASSP and, and others, on this report that you see pictured here. And this report highlights why states must support school and district leaders in becoming data literate and the steps they can take to do that. And it goes into more detail about context, you know, who we mean by administrators, what we mean by data literacy, but it's all to say that no matter what your role is or what your title is, if you are a school or district administrator, you should share that goal of supporting student success. And key to that is data literacy. Next slide. So what do we mean by data literacy? Well, DQC developed this definition that you see here collaboratively with the people and partners that were in our working group that helped us with this report. And so the definition we have come up with is that data literate school and district administrators continuously, effectively, and ethically access, interpret, act on, and communicate multiple types of data from state, local, school, and other sources to improve outcomes for all students in a manner that is appropriate to individual professional roles and responsibilities. So it is a mouthful, but it is a good, we think, a good definition and covers, you know, all the contextual factors and all the things that, that go into being an administrator and, and using data. Next slide. And so we also came up with this picture as part of this report. And as you can see in the little banner at the bottom, this is what we view administrator data literacy looking like in action. And so on the left hand side, you see supporting instruction, which of course is a critical part of a principal's job. But you know, and, and that requires a, a knowledge and understanding of academic data and the academic pieces. However, a principal's role extends far beyond that, which is why we also included fostering continuous improvement and communicating broadly. And that really um, resonates with me because I recently attended another presentation on this same topic and a principal was speaking and he said that nowadays public school principals, they're expected to be the CEO, the CFO, the CIO, you know, the chief facilitator, convener, presenter, you know, like you could go on and on for days. Um, and that's just, again, another example of how the school and district administrators do much more than support instruction. And so you require data literacy to use all these different types of data to make decisions. And Thankfully, you know, by working directly with school leaders on their understanding and use of data, organizations like New Leaders help bring data literacy to life. And so I think I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Krista to talk more about that. Yep. So strong leaders elevate uh, instruction and accelerate student learning, but their influence goes beyond that. So as you can see from the quotes here on the slide shared by several New Leader principals, a talented leader fosters a strong culture, um, which is inclusive of effective overall data practices that both build teacher capacity and it results um, in students thriving in schools. Uh, strong leaders also engage families, making sure that parents and guardians have what they need to feel like they're real, true partners in the success of their children. And finally, school leaders um, they set high expectations for students uh, and ensure that they have the right and the most appropriate support so that they can be successful in school. Next slide, please. So um, the work that we do at New Leaders is based on effective uh, leadership uh, practices, which morph into what we now call the New Leaders Trans Transformational Leadership Framework. And it is, um, a, it's, we, shorten it by calling it the TLF, and it's a growth tool that pretty much provides a roadmap for leaders to build vibrant schools where teachers and students can work together for a continuous improvement. It is not an evaluative tool, and it, is, it was not designed to replace any district-based or school-based tools. Rather, it just highlights some significant leadership actions that closely align to uh, getting the impact that we want to see relative to student gains. Next slide, please. When you think about the tool itself, we have defined or categorized or came up with five uh, categories of actions based on our studies of hundreds of fast improving high need schools. And what you'll find in these five categories are um, corresponding levels, levers, excuse me, and at school and principal based actions. 
but for the purposes of this, this webinar, I want to look closely at category one, which is learning and teaching, specifically lever three, which is data. Next slide, please. And so lever three has three significant actions, the one of which is identifying data sources and assessments. The second one is data analysis and action planning. And the third one is feedback on process, on progress. But the one that I want to draw your attention to is action two, which is data analysis and action planning. Now, if you look across the bottom um, at the data literate administrator actions, as well as the new leader principal actions, you, you should see strong connections and alignment between what those actions actually are. Um, what we specifically do in our programs at New Leaders is train and facilitate the learning of principles around building strong instructional leadership teams or appointing teacher leaders to lead specific grade level teams around the data-driven instruction process. More specifically, we provide or train around protocols that force these administrators and or teacher leaders to analyze data at three distinct levels, one being um, the standard. And so here's where we look at data and we ask, uh, what is the strength standard? We want to know like what areas or what standards do students do significantly or extremely well on, and we want to know like what's glaring in terms of like the growth standards. Where do, do we see more attention need, needing to be paid relative to a specific standard? The second level, um, uh, the second thing that we ask them to analyze is around the item or the task. And we want to know in this instance, like, what is the task or the item asking the student to do and at what level of thinking and complexity? We also want to know, is the item or the task fully aligned to the full depth of the standard? What that's going to tell us when we look at the student responses is, one, is it really um, a challenge relative to student misunderstanding or student misconceptions, or is it a teacher gap relative to the design of the item or the task? The third level would be looking at the student work itself. Again, whether it's multiple choice or whether it's a constructive response, we want to know what they seem to struggle with the most. And based on their responses, again, multiple choice or constructive response, what is the misconception? Why are they really struggling with that particular skill, concept, or topic that's embedded in the task? Um, and are there groups of students who actually share the same misconception? And that's important to know because when you're identifying those misconceptions and knowing whether or not students are sharing the same misconceptions, it's great because that's the place from which the action plan is created. Because you're building what we call corrective instruction around student deficit, student, student misconceptions, and it's going to tell you which kids need to be grouped together for targeted instruction or interventions that schools may have in place. Now, once that work is done, we ask administrators, and in some cases, district leaders, to think about what systems and structures need to be in place in order to push this kind of work forward so that it's happening across the school and not just in pockets for the greatest gain. And then what, 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 are you, what, what, what are administrators doing to make sure that they're monitoring progress and providing ongoing professional learning and feedback on the execution and the implementation of the, um, of the action plan? So I said a mouthful. Let's hear what this actually looks like in practice. And what I'm going to do now is turn it over to my dear colleague, Ed Morris, who is a former new leader trained principal. And now, um, Ed, I'll pop it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, so what I want to do for everyone is color um, the information that Chris had just shared with regards to the three actions that um, data literate principles use um, and give you a context so you can explicitly hear of some of the systems, the structures um, that have been put into place when this particular lever is executed with fidelity um, and with continuous improvement, particularly at a school level setting and higher. Um, so just to share a little bit again, so that you all have context about um, my background. Again, I head up the instructional design for the organization um, and Chris is my dear colleague and has um, literally built out a lot of the processes, um, a lot of the instruction, the training um, templates and coaching approaches for this whole notion of being driven by data. Um, 
And prior to our role in terms of being over the instructional design department for the organization, I was also the executive director for the aspiring principals program, which is New Leaders flagship program. And that gave me an amazing opportunity to not only see those aspiring principals who were going through our programming and seeing how they grappled with um, this whole notion of how do you use data and multiple streams of it effectively um, to build culture and then also drive academic success for children. Um, but I also had the opportunity to see, um, given the work that was taking place across the country, this beautiful, almost like kaleidoscope of leadership practices that our aspiring principals were implementing um, as well as building in the schools that they were being mentored in because they do a full year residency inside of a school from a mentor principal. Prior to that, I served as the regional um, director and coach in Chicago um, and had more of a hands-on opportunity to work with a number of aspiring principals who, even when they became principals, I'm still coaching and working with um, now that they are now becoming um, tenured principals. And in that particular role, you have the opportunity to struggle with new leaders, <laughs> no pun intended, that are struggling with, you know, this whole notion of knowing how to build structures and systems um, that are going to be impactful. Um, and prior to that, um, I was myself a new leader principal, um, and that is the notion um, that I'm going to speak from um, with regards to just some of the experiences that I had um, having the rich opportunity to apply what I learned in the Aspiring Principles program around being data literate. Um, just as a little bit of background about the school that I led, um, I was the principal for Dodge Renaissance Academy in Chicago Public Schools, which was one of the first three turnaround schools in Chicago Public School system. Um, during my tenure, um, we were able to um, accelerate student achievement um, dramatically um, because of so many different structures and systems um, that were already in place prior to um, me taking on the role of principal from my mentor who I got mentored under. Um, but we moved um, academic state achievement for our students um, with a population of almost 500 students um, from roughly 62% of our students meeting achievement state standards. Um, and within my first two years, um, we were achieving about 84% of our children <laughs> um, meeting or exceeding state standards. Um, just as even as a microcosm of that, um, from math, um, our students grew exponentially because of this whole notion of data literacy as a culture across the entire school, we went from having roughly 64% of our students meeting or achieving state standards to 94% of my children um, meeting or exceeding state standards. This is all within my first two years because of continuing the practice of being data literate. And so what I wanna do is in that context, if you think about that as our cradle for this story, um, share with you some of the important actions that the report speaks to. Number one, um, for those that have read the report, it states that data literate administrators take the lead on deciphering what data is important and how it is being collected and generated. And they also ensure that it's valid, reliable, appropriate, and high quality. So what this means in practice is that for the principal, the principal has to ensure that any data that comes from central office management, um, it has to be distilled through the leader in the context of the culture at the school. Um, before it gets disseminated. And it doesn't mean that it gets changed, it gets distilled. Um, I have a, the fortune of having a science background. My, my undergrad is in cell bio. And so we 
had to do tons and tons of like data analysis. And there's one thing that scientists know is that you have to adhere to the fidelity of what the numbers represent, but the interpretation is where you actually have the opportunity to bring change um, or to shift a hypothesis or to confirm or validate your initial findings. Um, so with education, what we did inside of the school as, as an administrative team and as my leadership team is, we always process every single point of data that came either from the state um, and hate to be anal, but there were even a number of instances in which we collected our weekly teacher assessment data and looked at that data to see where was their alignment and misalignment. Um, I'll give you an example in terms of speaking to ensuring that data is appropriate and reliable. During the early days of the release of the Northwest Evaluation Association's um, MAP assessment, NWEA, um, we were a pilot school for that in Chicago. And um, we didn't have a clear understanding as a district initially for the intended use of the MAP assessment. Um, a number of um, administrators use it for evaluative purposes. Um, I wasn't really sure about that and thus had my principal supervisor and the data team for the network that I was a part of to go back and do some further research and pull in the intended use of the data that was coming out of this NWEA data report. And we discovered that the intended use was for planning that shifts the entire notion of the outcomes that we were seeing, as well as how I was working with my teachers, uh, because in the school that we were in, I met with all of my teachers every single week, um, reviewing this data and thinking from the evaluative notion. And on the other side of the research, in terms of making sure that we applied it appropriately, shifted my weekly meetings to focus on the planning that teachers were doing. And it just had a, a completely different impact on student achievement, obviously, as well as the teacher's instruction. So I just want to give a little caveat when it comes to ensuring that you as a data leader administrator, not only understand how to use data, but that you also ensure that what is being disseminated to those that you are working with are using that data correctly. Another thing that um, the report shares that data literate administrators also demonstrate the value of data for meeting goals by modeling effective data use. And I want to share with everyone that, um, again, just as a data literate principal, um, again, all data got processed through me if it was coming from the district. Um, and the way that my team and I engage with the data set is that, yes, we were given these gorgeous, beautiful graphs um, and all of these wonderful representations, but we drilled down to the point of trying to determine how could we concisely communicate what the reports were showing us to our teachers so that it would empower them to do even a further analysis one, um, how could we equip those teachers to then share that data effectively with their students? Two, and then number three, how could we also process the data so that when we were having parent meetings by grade level and our whole school current state analysis, current ideals, like this is the state of Dodge address, our parents and our community um, supporters understood that data. And so what that does, it compels the leader to process data in a completely different way. Um, and in doing so, I am modeling for my teachers and the community how to access data and then create structures within a session or within a certain time frame for the receivers of that data to then go back and analyze it so that we could come together and collaborate after the data analysis. Now, what that means then is that I also had to create in my schedule every other week the opportunity to sit with every individual teacher in my school 
Um, and yes, I had my assistant principal and like two other teacher leaders who met with me, who assisted me with this. Um, we would have individual one hour meetings um, to ensure that during a teacher's prep, there was coverage so that the teacher could collaborate with one of us as a school leadership team, um, not around the analysis piece, but around the action piece of doing data literate work. Um, we did not spend time doing analysis. It didn't make sense. Um, and in such cases where my teachers needed to be equipped with data analysis, that was something completely different. In some instances, I provided data analysis for them and then walked them through how I analyzed their data to, again, expeditiously get them to the planning piece. Now, what happens is that on the other side of planning, what we did for the rest of the year, because there's a lot of different data sources that are coming in, is that every other week I had these um, corrective action planning meetings with my teachers where we looked at the results from a formative assessment that a teacher gave and then compared that to um, the instruction that was going on in the classroom. Um, so that's just an idea. Um, in regards to how teachers can be supported by a principal. Um, another thing that the report speaks to is to use data in order to foster a culture of collaboration, collective responsibility, and continuous improvement. Now, earlier you all heard Krista speak to this diagnostic work that we do in New Leaders. Um, and that, that diagnostic work is non-evaluative. Just as a point of training with new principals and um, their mentors that I worked with when I was in Chicago, we use the diagnostic to help spread the love across many different people groups um, within a school community. And there's power in diagnosing a school um, if there is this understanding that it is not evaluative. If you have the opportunity to realize that, hmm, if I am diagnosing the current state of a school, it gives me and the community the opportunity to collectively design a set of priorities based on data analysis. And so I'll give you an example. Um, there was a school that was failing in Chicago and the principal was newly appointed. I had just recently coached this young man. It was a high school um, in the north side of Chicago, um, has a huge population of students who um, are either homeless or moving in and out of the community. Um, and the teaching staff um, was exceptionally tenured. And I'll let you infer what that means. Um, we were able, using the diagnostic approach, to build within I want to say maybe the first semester, a change in mindset across the entire school because he purposed the diagnostic tool as an opportunity to get rich buy-in from the strong leaders all the way down to teachers and deans in the building. And I helped him facilitate a two-day session of diagnosing the current state of the school with deans, the teachers, and walking through all the different components of school life from academia to the budget to attendance to behavior and seeing that team develop a set of priorities for the year. It set a culture up so that he could then get into some really robust, um, difficult conversations because there was buy-in done through the diagnosis work. So that's just something I want to speak to is that you, in, in a lot of our schools, you just can't jump into, let's just analyze data. Um, I had the misfortune of doing that and offending my teachers when I was a resident principal um, because I, um, put a lot of judgment into my presentation and the analysis pieces, and I didn't consider the impact of building culture with them, me showing them that, one, they could trust me with their data, one, and number two, that together we can collaborate and even get to what was more important, which was focusing on problem solving. Another thing that I want to share, too, that the report shares is that um, 
data literate administrators gather and use student learning data, administrative data, and other classroom performance data, and I'm going to dare say other streams of data to identify aggregate student needs in order to set goals for the school. I want to give you a crazy example of how something that is not even academic impacts academic data. Um, and I want to talk about the role that a uh, principal plays in terms of being a fiscal, what's the word I want to use? A fiscal steward of the resources that we have to impact achievement. And I mean the budget for school. Um, there was one time when I was principal where we could not tell what was going on. Um, there was too much loss of instruction time um, during my second year um, of being a principal with two grade levels. So I ended up having to do a little bit of a data analysis. Um, and what I did is that I took two weeks with my deans, the lunch staff, the janitorial staff, to literally time the arrivals and the dismissals of our students coming in and out of the cafeteria. Here's what we discovered. We discovered a few things in terms of the impact on finances and academic achievements. The equipment that the lunch staff was working with was outdated. <laughs> and so they were losing time um, in terms of getting food out to the children because there was a lot of movement with only working out of a certain compartment within the old equipment versus an expanded updated set. Another thing we decided, we determined, our clocks were off. Oh my goodness, the clocks were off. And so the time inside of the teacher's classroom was completely different than the time inside of the cafeteria. Here's the impact on student achievement. We discovered that our teachers who were waiting to pick up their children from the cafeteria were going by their clocks, which were set to somewhere of like 10 to 12 minutes later than what was in the cafeteria. So that is 10 to 12 minutes of instruction time lost. So what that did for me as an analyzer of data, is that I then took that analysis set and then compared it to the way that we were spending our allocations financially and shifted some money. And a few things got changed. We paid for equipment for the, tea, for the um, lunch staff so that they had a better set of equipment to work with. Clocks were aligned throughout the entire school, which meant that I had to buy a clock system. And I was able to then go back and work with teachers um, to ensure that there was instruction taking place from the classroom down to the lunchroom um, and bring using that opportunity to help them optimize every single minute because every single minute counts for our children. So just on the short end, this to show you that, again, when you're gathering data, it's student learning data, it's administrative data, it's it's fiscal data, it's class and performance data, it all matters so that what you can do as a data informed, data literate administrator is triangulate all those points and make the right kinds of decisions in order to shift money, in order to shift attention, in order to even shift human capital to the right spaces so that our children can learn. So those are just a few examples that I want to share with everyone with regards to the application of some of the findings of the report that came um, from the Data Quality Collaborative. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to, um, oh no, actually, next slide. What I like to do is open up the floor um, and find out if you consider some of the things that I've shared with regards to structures and application, and if you think about what Chris has shared with regards to how it fits into the transformational leadership framework that we showed. What's resonating for you about those actions? Um, what else might you add? And are there any questions that you'd like to put on the table right now at this point? Yeah, so if folks have questions, please do enter them into, um, into the questions box. And, and while we're waiting to see if people do have questions, I just want to say like, 
at everything you shared was fantastic. Thank you. Especially that, that clock example really stuck with me because I think that is the perfect example of, of a data point or something that has to do with data that not everyone thinks of and in, in especially in a principal's day to day, right. And, and yeah. all the different types of, of data that, that a principal, you know, at any administrator really, and, and teachers as well, the whole school, it, it, it involves, and you know, everyone from janitorial to transportation. To, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you. For yeah, I will, yeah, I will share that, um, again, out of that discovery of that one incident, when I moved back into the organization, um, you know, I was pretty adamant that we had to have a year long project called a budget and resource analysis project, um, which we did build into our training for our principals. I think sometimes we forget that we are empowering classroom teachers who are significantly awesome at their craft, and that is teaching. Not everyone has a business background or a corporate background. You know, I went through alternative certifications. So I had some idea around like how to do audits um, and how to look at money coming into the role of a teacher. But that's something that system administrators should also consider is how do I equip my principals and school leaders, heck, um, teacher leaders, and I would even dare say parent leaders with how to actually access the right kind of data, translate it after an analysis, and then get to action plan. Um, Jess, and I know we have a little bit of time, I want to take it up just a little bit, but you know, I think back to um, my parent advisory council president, um, how as a principal, I had to take time with her to show her how to properly look at a data set of information, collect survey responses from parents in our school before she allocated um, different accounts for the way that she was going to spend the Parent Advisory Council budget. Um, and then also looking at that information to determine what kind of programming was she going to host for parents throughout the year. Um, it had to be based on data. So again, that's, that's just a, a rich cascading effect that I think we need to consider is principal supervisors, superintendents, we need to train our leaders on data one and how to use it and how to triangulate and then how to equip them to equip others to do the exact same process so you get this um, perpetuation of being data littered throughout the entire community beyond just central office management yeah i'm with you on that i think the way you both talk about um data is so powerful right it's it's a tool that can and should be used for continuous improvement um, data for compliance is, is always going to be something that, yes, we're going to have to check certain boxes by using data, but additionally, it can help open so many doors and answer so many questions and shine a light on, on what is and is not working. Okay, well, I, I don't think our audience has any further questions about, um, about the third lever, but I am going to, we will put up our contact information um, at the end of, of the webinar too. So if people have questions afterward, they can reach out to, to, to any of us as well. Um, and so Ed, do you have anything else that you wanted to share? I sure do. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> Um, I want to lift up again, Jess, um, the power of being relevant. You will notice that from the findings um, that there is this whole notion, and I don't know if we can go back to the slide, it'll be slide 17. Slide 17, yep, 17, keep going. Keep going. Right there. So there's something that I think is critical for um, all of us as educators. This whole notion around foster continuous improvement. Um, there is power in this term foster. Foster by default indicates a sense of cultivating over time. And the only way that cultivation is going to happen is 
if there is broad communication, good and bad, but very thorough over time, and that there are systems for communicating with people around all things data. I want to share with everyone that it can be difficult and challenging. I do not want to present this notion like you can come in and have a completely fully data literate um, school within one year, especially if that has not been the practice. That has not been my experience from my observations, as well as coaching a large number of principals that have been in schools where data literate practices were not school wide. Um, Typically, and I will share this, we have discovered that it does take, if you want to have a solid base um, of moving into some really robust nuances of data-driven instruction and data-driven decision-making, it takes several months, several months um, to get all the systems and structures in place effectively so that you can perpetuate um, on into the following school year. So I just want to lift that up. Then when we say foster, that word is pretty rich, and I do not want people to miss what is meant underneath that term foster. We're talking about a constant cultivation, and then number two, um, a constant extending of self as school leader to stay cognizant of what data exists. Um, number two, determining where you need to provide individual support to teachers, to your um, ancillary staff, and to your parents, um, all the way down to, hey, I am releasing a brochure for you parents. Here's how you read this and we can have some conversations. I would like to get feedback from you about whether the communication is working or not. This is lying underneath the fostering continuous improvement as well as communicating product. I just want to speak to that um, because I think it's important that we don't get um, swallowed up um, with regards to, for example, why was it that my school was able to have a 20 percentage point gain within my first two years? There were strong pieces around fostering and communicating broadly that were in place that allowed me to push the limit um, that allowed us to get the national attention that we received, um, particularly in Chicago um, and in other states. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right, right? Like this is, what's hard is hard. It's not gonna happen overnight, right? It's, it takes a lot of work and investment, but when you do put investment into data literacy, like as you experienced, Ed, the results are just amazing and it's, it's absolutely worth it. Yes. So what I do you wanna share, and this would be slide um, 16, um, just so that everyone knows that within the new leaders organization, our transformational leadership framework um, is specific to school leaders, um, but we do facilitate learning around data literacy in all of our programs. And as you will see on this slide here, go back one thing, um, is that we do offer this type of program across the entire spectrum of leadership, all the way down to teacher leaders up to like principal supervisors, assistant superintendents. Um, please note that this is not meant to suggest that everyone goes through any type of linear process, but rather that we do meet the leader where she is and bring our expertise to enhance that particular type of support and learning that they are going through. Um, so I just want to share that. And again, just as an example, um, you can see here um, on this slide that we have programming that supports um, caring and aspiring leaders. Um, we have um, programming that supports this work around data literacy, data literacy um, around working with teens, um, which is critical inside of schools, and going all the way up to training principal supervisors. So I just want to just give everybody that overview. And if anyone has questions, please definitely feel free to reach out to us. We love to share um, the learning that we have had since 2000. Great, thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So bringing back this picture because, you know, Ed, everything that I just said, I think really speaks to meeting people where they are. And that is at the core of 
any work around data or data literacy. And so over the past year, we've seen states working on their implementation plans around the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. And clearly, they, they have very ambitious goals to improve their schools and their districts, which is really promising. And but at the end of the day, school and district leaders are the ones responsible for improving those schools and implementing that accountability. And so that's why that now more than ever, it's important that states support administrator data literacy. And so DQC developed recommendations included in the, in the report, again, in collaboration with Krista and, and folks at New Leaders, NASSP, and other great partners, um, all of whom are listed in the report as well. And um, yes, these re recommendations are primarily for state policymakers, but ever since this report was released in July of this year, we've seen online, you know, principals, superintendents, and other administrators sharing it as well. And I think it's because, you know, they see themselves in it, it, it resonates with them. And so that is our hope for, for those of you who are tuning in, is that you can see yourself in this report as well. Next slide, please. So the first category for the recommendations is promote data use skills. So for here we recommend embedding the definition of data literacy into school and district administrator policies. Next, we recommend promoting, supporting, and incentivizing job-based professional development that's career long, which is to say that training should be side by side with exactly what Ed and Krista talked about, continuous improvement and, and professional learning that is career long, um, in addition to, to a great pre-service training program. Next slide. Next category, ensure ease of access. So consider making an assessment of available data to ensure relevance, provide administrators with actionable, easy to access data, and ensure that schools and districts have the needed technical infrastructure for easy data use. Next slide. Last but definitely not least, safeguard privacy, because secure data and data literacy go hand in hand. Um, so design and implement policies and practices to, to protect the privacy and confidentiality of student, teacher, and administrator data and ensure that systems are secure and provide school and district administrators with tools and resources to understand how to safeguard data, use it ethically, and also communicate about privacy to their families and communities. And before we transition to, to the q and I just want to close by saying that as school leaders, you should feel empowered to ask for these types of supports, not only from the district leaders that you work with, but also from your state leaders as well, because school leaders deserve this support and students will succeed when you get this support. And with that, I want to check on our questions. Looks like we have a, kind of a, a quieter audience that's getting excited to go trick or treating. But I, I have thought about you know some things that I want to ask you all. So and you can ask me questions as well too. Um, Krista, what is Krista or and Ed? What's next for new leaders? Glad you asked. Um, so as you all saw, we do have a pretty wide swath of programming um, and we focused the past two or three years very heavily on how do we make our signature programs um, that were originally designed for teacher leaders and um, for aspiring principals, how do we make that more flexible um, so that whether you've gone through our signature programs or not, we have the opportunity to engage in some of the rich learning. So we've shifted very heavily to providing flexible engagement type of um, professional development for all of our um, interested district partners. Um, we are excited to be launching um, what is now going to be called um, leadership networks, which will allow us um, for program year 2019-2020 to do district saturation of our professional development offerings, um, funneling all the way up from principal supervisors down to teachers, to classroom teachers. So we're really excited about that and we are going to pilot that 
um, if all goes well in a couple of districts. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. But we're looking to um, really build a even a stronger and a deeper um, database of proof points um, where we can show the results of what happens when you have um, district saturation um, of really robust um, quality professional development. Krista, anything to add? Nope, I think Ed hit the nail on the head with the flexible programming and the leadership network um, work that's forthcoming, so no, you got it all. Okay, and Krista, I think we do have a question that, that you could answer. Someone asked yeah. um, how they can learn more about the transformational leadership framework. She has the book, which is the Breakthrough Principles book that was in, that you talked about mm -hmm. and is included, um, but she would like to learn more about effective implementation. Ah, good question. So one of the things that we're in conversation right now is um, about uh, is pulling together like all the tools and potentially some additional framing around the tools as um, resources that people can use in their schools. But what we haven't quite ironed out yet is what that might look like um, from somebody in the organization relative to giving some additional framing, framing and or training specifically around those particular tools for implementation. So that is something that we will carry back to our team because we're the ones who are pulling it together to kind of figure out and talk through what that could potentially look like to offer up um, some additional services that are not specifically grounded in our programming structures. Sounds good. And then we have one question that I believe is for Ed. In sharing data, did you use data walls or how was data displayed and shared? Oh, I'm so glad she talked about data walls. I forgot about that. Oh, <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Super quick. Um, yes, I use data walls, plural. Um, but again, you always have to think about intention. I've been in schools where I've coached where data walls were only in the main office. Um, not sure what impact they would have on the user. But when I was principal, we had a master data wall that was available for parents and anyone coming into the school. But I placed a stronger emphasis on ensuring that data walls were inside every single classroom, all the way down to our first graders. Um, our, I'll give an example, like my first grade teacher um, became a master at creating a data wall that was visual enough to like show little frogs showing how students were growing um, from one assessment or one scale to another skill um, all the way up to your traditional data wall usage um, that you would find like in your middle school or your high school. Um, so yes, I definitely did have data walls, but again, they were for my students. Um, they weren't just for presentation purposes. It was a functional use of space. Don't waste it if you're just trying to show presentation. Great. Well, folks, please do feel free to submit any more questions, but that is all we had for now. Um, but yeah, I'll say again that our contact information is up on the screen, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us if, or if you're watching the recording now and have questions, please do reach out. Um, but I, I'm going to go ahead and, and conclude the webinar then and Thank you, Krista and Ed, so much again for joining us. And thank you all for tuning in as well. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Halloween and a great rest of the week as well. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.